Here you go, baby. Hey, can you guys hear me with this? So what I'm going to ask you to do right now is the same thing that we did um, at Waterman to make sure that we're all social distancing proper. So put your arms out. For those of you who weren't there, I want you to have your full wingspan in between you and any other people. So thank you to everyone who made it here without getting lost. If you did get lost, I don't really know what to tell you. Um, the rhythm wasn't great, but we survived. You know, we're here. So we're going to get started with our speakers in just one second. Uh, but one question that people may have is, why are you here? Why are you children annoyed this time? Um, and that is a valid question. Um, so before we start off with our speakers, I'm going to read off our list of demands. Um, we have 14 demands, so I'm sorry, but I'm going to try and be as brief as possible so that we can get other people up on the stage. One, we demand that UVM takes immediate steps to address the climate crisis in line with the 2010 Climate Action Plan. legislation 
and instead develop a comprehensive plan to address the climate crisis in Vermont that is consistent with the magnitude of the problem. We ask that all Vermonters consider Scott's failed leadership on climate change when voting for a gubernatorial candidate this year. Eleven, we demand that all F-35s be grounded immediately. Twelve, we demand that Burlington end its complicity with racist resource wars by terminating its lease of 281 acres of land to the U.S. Air Force. In addition to causing the deaths of innocent civilians around the world and upending lives in foreign countries, militarism has an outsized impact on the environment. The U.S. Department of Defense is the single largest producer of greenhouse emissions in the world. Thirteen, we demand that the Vermont National Guard stop training for wars and refocus its mission on fighting the pandemic, racism, and climate change in providing humanitarian aid. Fourteen, this is the last one. We demand a national Green New Deal that prioritizes social justice, science-based reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, in a 10-year timeline, deep cuts to the military budget, and a just transition that prioritizes the most vulnerable people in indigenous sovereignty. So that was a lot of information. So take some time to let that sink in. Um, take all the questions, thoughts, and feelings that you might have, and I encourage you to take them to our discussion at Battery Street Park. After we are done here at City Hall, any of the organizers here at this event would be glad to talk to you about anything and everything. Um, and now, I'm very, very pleased to invite up to the stage our first speaker for today, State Representative Brian Chino. Thanks for your patience while we um, sterilize things. It's still weird getting used to this. So. so I know everybody's been loud for a minute, but I'm gonna ask everyone to be quiet for a minute. Can you put your fists up? And for those who don't know that when fists go up, we all be quiet and listen. So you can put your fists down. And if you're comfortable, close your eyes and just take some deep breaths slowly in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just notice how it feels to breathe and how it feels to breathe in the clean air. And take a moment to just focus on your connection to that air and notice your feet on the earth. Notice what it feels like to be grounded in the earth. And take a deep breath and feel your connection to all of the life around you. Notice the space inside yourself. Take a deep breath and notice your, that space inside of yourself. And the connection between what's inside of you and everything that's outside of you. And let's take a moment just to give thanks and feel gratitude to the wind, to the water, to the earth, to all of the plants and all of the animals, and even all of the fungi, and to all of our relations in the web of life that sustain us. Thanks. Everybody say thanks. Thank you. Uliuni. That means thank you in Abenaki. Uliuni. So we, I just wanted to start out with a moment of gratitude for creation, but now I'm gonna to speak to you, my fellow human beings. 
So we are living out of balance with our environment. And there are many symptoms of this disease. One of the major symptoms is climate change due to greenhouse gas emissions. Our world is facing climate emergency, mass extinction, and ecological collapse as a consequence of human economic activity over the past 400 years, which did not account for the full impact of the economy on the environment or on the societies. Climate change is a major symptom of a greater illness, one that has been a terminal illness for so many species and cultures, and it will be the end for so many more if we do not bring ourselves back into balance with the web of life and with our Mother Earth. The imbalance of our modern way of life is deeply rooted in the history of colonization. Colonization laid the foundation for our current extractive economic system, which exploits the labor of people and depletes the resources of the planet. This society was built on land stolen from indigenous people and built on the backs of enslaved people, indentured servants, and low-wage workers and immigrants. Our history is filled with trauma and suffering which haunts us to this very day. And until we acknowledge the roots of our problems, our current problems, in our past and in our history, we cannot create authentic solutions for our future. We need processes of truth and reconciliation for colonization and for the institution of slavery. We must acknowledge the connection between systemic racism and environmental justice. For example, the impact of hydroelectric dams in Quebec or the mining of rare metals in Africa and South America on indigenous communities. Climate solutions that do not take into account racial and social justice are continuing the historic pattern of passing the true costs of our economy onto the most impacted people and the lands that they inhabit. So what do we do about it? To address climate change, we need a long-term plan to create a just transition from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. One that moves from maintaining the legacy of colonization to manifesting collective liberation. Vermont must build resiliency and create a roadmap to guide us through this just transition from an extractive economy to a new economy that repairs and restores the earth. A regenerative economy is an economic system that works to regenerate natural and human resources. And in developing a regenerative economy, Vermont must engage people in their local communities to solve problems and find ways to combine solutions for the existing goals that we have, such as recycling, greenhouse gas reduction, and wastewater management. Economic control should be rooted in our local communities, and people should have increased power over the decisions that affect their lives through direct democracy, such as regional people's assemblies. The regenerative economy should retain and restore cultures and traditions while recognizing that some of our practices of the, of the past are harmful and need to go and we need to adapt for the greater good. A regenerative economy will transition away from practices that engage in extraction of natural resources and will instead advance ecological restoration and preserve that biodiversity by both protecting and regenerating natural resources. The dynamics of our workforce and our workplaces must also shift from exploitation to cooperation as human potential is nurtured and human resources are regenerated. All present and all future economic development should always account for social equity and environmental protection and the ecological and social well-being of all people and of all life. Because there cannot be economic justice without racial justice and social equity, the new economy must recognize and rectify the intersection of systematized oppressions. Vermont must build the foundation of a new economic and social system that creates economic opportunity and high quality of life for all people, that builds our public assets and the commons, and that empowers people to exercise self-determination and freedom. We can all live well in balance with one another if we set our minds to it. Thank you. So repeat after me. Truth and reconciliation. 
Truth and reconciliation. Indigenous repatriation. Indigenous repatriation. Decolonization. Collective liberation. Planetary regeneration. Thank you. Next up, we have Made. Come on up, Made, while we sterilize the microphone again. And Jada, if Jada wants to come up too. Yeah, Jada. I'm with the Black Perspective. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, woo, woo, yeah, there we go. What a turnout, what a turnout. Oh, amazing. Um, so in the Black Perspective, what we do is like, you know, community-based events, oriented community, I can't even talk. Hi, doggo. Or we're just gonna, there we go. Bye, doggo. All right, um, so what we do is try to, Try to work with the community and issues that are going up with racial, racial, racial issues, basically. And climate change is one of them. So, in order for us to change and be more progressive, we need to do it as a community, as 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 a whole, basically. As individuals, we can only get a certain amount of things done, but as a collective, we can get a lot done. And yeah, um, I'm gonna give it off to Jada now. Jada got some words to say. Yeah. Hey. Hey. Okay. So I got some, I got a few things I gotta get off my chest. This is a cute turnout. Um, but where is everyone? Um, I don't believe that we can thrive if we don't sustain our planet. Like, there can be no life without an earth. Like, you know? Um, I haven't been to Mars. I, I hear the weather's great, but I feel like they won't let black people to Mars, you know? I feel like the aliens, they're mad racist. I'm just guessing. I don't have like proof or anything. Don't quote me on that. Okay, no, uh, thank y'all for coming out in support of climate justice. I love that shit. Climate justice equals racial justice, yes. Um, if, your, if your environmentalism is not intersectional, you're doing it wrong. I'm sorry to tell you. Hate to break it to you, love, but if it doesn't include black, brown, and indigenous folks of color, hmm, it's not justice. I don't know her. Okay. I believe that um, black people will save the world. I think um, we are inherently magical and just worthy of so much more. Um, and I feel as though since y'all are here, you also believe that with me. Yeah. Word, 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 word. Okay, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page and everything. Um, I think it's really important and very imperative that you center black folks um, in your movement, whatever movement that may be. Uh, BIPOC are the heart, soul, and, you know, energy behind every mass movement. Like, black women, black, uh, specifically black trans women, 
have centered and been the forefront of every single fucking movement in this nation and other nations around the globe. Is that Bernie Sanders? Bernie! Oh, that's not Bernie, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not high. <laughs> I wish I was, but I'm not. Okay, I'm sorry. I got really starstruck. Um, inorganically. I apologize. Everybody calm down. That's not Brady. Okay, sorry. My eyes are bad. Um, woo! Okay. Shut the hell up. Um, but yeah, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, black Joy Matters. Black Futures Matters. Um, I think, I think there's this misconception that to support black lives means to just like show up and have a sign, right? But no, it means to protect. And whenever you're in a space with a black person, you don't have to speak up for us, just pass the fucking mic, you know? Um, we can speak for ourselves. It's been freaking centuries, excuse me, it's been fucking centuries of people speaking for us. Like, we don't need that. We don't, we, do, we never asked for it. We never requested it. We never, you know, wrote it down and passed it to some to someone. I just stuttered, I'm so sorry. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, I think it's really, really uh, beneficial to have a black friend. And not a black friend meaning like, a token, like someone you just call to not look racist. No, an actual friend, like someone you love and can depend on because black people are magic. And when you, um, when you love a black person, you are saving the world. So, so black love is, is climate justice. If you didn't know. Okay, I want y'all to move a little closer to me. Is that okay? Just move a little, a little closer. Um, still, you know, maintaining social distance. We're going to do something. Yeah, do, yeah, yeah. We want the wingspan, so we want you to look closer. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to do a little something, something. Because uh, y'all got to redeem y'all selves. Because that shit y'all pulled walking up Main Street was some bullshit. I don't want to see that again. You heard me? It triggered me and my homegirls. Don't do that shit. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to yell, but come on, catch the beat. Okay, so I want y'all to snap. Okay, oh, y'all sound good. Okay, so y'all just snap. They can snap. It was snappy, it was clapping through them all. Okay, I got it. Y'all should have told me that y'all were snappers. Okay. Keep that beat. Don't lose it. Hey. Hey, okay. Y'all like that? All right. Okay, okay. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Oh, me. Keep that snap. Don't lose that snap. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Louder. Indigenous rights. 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 Indigenous repatriate, Sean. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Indigenous rights. Keep that snap going. Keep that snap going. Oh. I feel like freestyling. No, I'm not gonna do it. Keep that snap go. I got. I need that snap. Louder. Can y'all snap a little louder? Two fingers, two fingers. I mean, two hands. Okay. Sorry, be back, be back, be back. Okay, okay, here I go. Here I go. Here I go. Here I go. For my flow. Okay, 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 here, for real, for real, okay. I didn't hear y'all. Okay, there we go, there we go. So we own Church Street, just you and me. Climate justice, you heard this. Climate justice. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, can we switch to climate?
clap, team. Let's clap. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. When I say Rebo, you say Lucian. Rebo. Lucian. Rebo. 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 No air pollution. It rhymes. It rhymes. Okay. Hey. Oh. Hey. Oh. Hey. Oh. Cool. Stop clapping. <laughs> okay. I have successfully stoned. You are welcome. I'm not the speaker. some F-35s for a while, and now I run fossil fuel resistance campaigns for 350 Vermont. Today, I want to talk to you about literal and figurative bullshit. I hope it, I, I'm glad it's okay to swear here, because there's a lot to swear about right now. I work at a job that should have been obsolete decades ago, yet I still hear how the older generation, my generation makes older generations hopeful. So often they use this hope to recuse themselves from taking action, and the messiah complex surrounds figures like Greta Thunberg. Meanwhile, companies like Vermont Gas promise net zero by 2050. I'll be nearly 60 by then if I live that long. Maybe I'm coming off as brusque, but I'm not here to give you platitudes about working together. You all clearly know how to do that already. I'm here to tell you what I see. I was asked to speak about greenwashing here in Burlington a city which styles itself as progressive and green. In terms of being progressive, it took over 1,500 comments to begin a conversation about defunding the police, and demands weren't even met after that. Were the, was the city afraid of the word defund? Should we call it net zero police? And, and what about Burlington's claim to be renewable? Well, it gets a huge amount of energy from Hydro-Quebec, which Brian mentioned, and just this last week we crashed a webinar for the CEO of Hydro-Quebec, who is formerly the CEO of the company that owned Vermont Gas. She said of the indigenous folks that she had apparently spoken to, quote, they were thinking with their hearts and not their heads. Wow. That's, some, that's somehow even more troubling than when she told me fossil fuel is not chocolate. She said that. But hey, snark aside, she's a woman CEO, so I guess using feminism as a front for fracking is what I should have done. <laughs> Let me paint you a picture of 350 Vermont's work. A Black Lives Matter and a rainbow flag dangle beneath Vermont Gas's fancy, fancy new logo at their headquarters. Outside their headquarters are protesters, and inside their pipeline is poison. And where is this gas coming from in the first place? Over 2,000 miles away on Lubicon Cree First Nations territory in so-called Alberta. The pipeline was built by imported workers from a company called Michaels, which is also built in Keystone XL and parts of the border wall. More recently, Vermont Gas began the literal and figurative bullshit phase of their campaign to keep fracking alive. So-called renewable natural gas, or biogas, which relies on waste and will eventually require land grabs. Vermont Gas has about 2% of this renewable, quote unquote, renewable product, which is analogous to telling a cancer patient you've cured about 2% of their cancer, but they'll be fine. In short, you can pay, okay, pay attention to this part, it's gonna get convoluted, real quick. In short, you can pay a tariff for some of your gas to be imported from Canada, which is trash, which then props up the fracking industry and perpetuates the exploitation of indigenous people in addition to worsening the climate crisis, but I guess we can call this the climate solution, right? Are there any business majors that want to invest in that? Great. So 
We have been working for years to stop the build out of Vermont Gas's pipeline infrastructure. We stopped it from going under Lake Champlain to Rutland to Bristol and to Moncton. Still, the one phase of the pipeline that was actually built is wrapped up in litigation over safety and construction concerns. During the ongoing investigation, when folks smelled a gas leak near the pipeline, someone noted Mr. St. Hilaire, VP of Operations, informed us that it was probably just the smell of rotting hay. I'm serious, the guy in charge of the pipeline said that. I'm actually quite a serious person, I'm going to get back to that right now. We don't do this work because we're deluded by hope. I don't believe we will see some triumphant moment where we win and suffering and oppression are canceled. We do this work because we can ease just a little bit of the suffering. We block trains carrying 10,000 tons of coal. We divest our schools from fossil fuels. We care for each other, and it is an honor to be part of that. Before I go, and speaking of stopping coal and gas, there are two events I'd like to tell you about real quick. Uh, Monday, 5 to 6 p.m. at Oak Ledge Park, there will be an info session for the No Coal, No Gas campaign, which is trying to shut down the last major coal plant in the region. And um, tomorrow, from, from uh, 9 to 4, will be a nonviolent direct action training online hosted by 350 Vermont, No Coal, No Gas, and the Climate Disobedience Center in preparation for the upcoming election. Thank you. Martin Luther King identified the U.S. government as, quote, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. King called for a revolution to abolish racism, materialism, poverty, and militarism. We need that revolution now to bring all our soldiers home from the endless wars for oil, and to keep them home. We need that revolution to protect families from state violence targeting Vermonters with the outrageous noise of F-35 jets in a city. Each F-35 burns 1,100 gallons of jet fuel an hour, each one of the jets, to train for wars for oil. Wars we must abolish. The F-35 is designed to drop both conventional and nuclear bombs in wars based on lies, like the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. But the F-35 cannot protect us from climate change, from hurricanes or pandemics. The F-35 cannot protect us from racist, systematic racism or killer cops, or from a failed criminal justice system that stuffs the jails with black and brown people while letting the billionaires who run uh, who run these drug companies that inflicted huge damage with their opioids go scot-free. Or the people who've inflicted the F-35 on Winooski. We have a corrupt Vermont political class serving the military industrial complex as their first priority. The F-35 cannot protect us from in income inequality, from job loss, or from evictions. The F-35 cannot protect women, African Americans, immigrants, refugees, LGBTQ, or veterans. 
The F-35 program drains $1.4 trillion from health care, education, and affordable housing. The F-35 does not fight the billionaire class, the people who give us all of these horrors, or the fossil fuel industry, or the white nationalists. It does not drive money out of politics. It does not abolish tuition or student debt. The F-35 doesn't do very much for the American people or for Vermonters. F-35 flights in a city are for practice making war against poor people of color in oil-rich countries. That's what all these military forces have been doing since the Vietnam War. That is why they chose Burlington instead of the five other locations that were far away from populated areas. The runway in Burlington aims at Winooski. They knew that. The military gets to practice the intentional neglect they're going to impose on these poor countries in the Middle East and other places, in Venezuela, in Iran, in any place they want to go after people. They're practicing on the most ethnically diverse working class city in the state. This is what the Air Force itself calls disproportionate impact on low income and minority populations. The F-35 is environmental racism on steroids, and it's gotta be abolished. said the extreme noise of the F-35 when it's taking off and landing in a city is going to make 3,000 affordable homes uninhabitable with noise so loud it can permanently damage hearing, learning, and the cognitive development of children. That means their brains and their hearing organs. Thousands of working class children and families flagrantly abused by who? By Vermont's political and military leaders to serve who? The military industrial complex. That's who they prioritize. You know, you don't have to put F-35 jets in a city. They had other choices. Why did they pick Vermont? Of the biggest, I'm sorry, why did they pick the most populated position? part of Vermont, the part where they could aim at Winooski. You know, if this airport's runway aimed at the Summit Street where the mayor lives, nobody would have even considered facing F-35 jets. F-35 training flights in a city benefit only the 1%. It's not just the jet fuel dealers with their tens of thousands of gallons. It's also the developers. The mayor, formerly an airport commissioner, cleverly, brilliantly used the F-16 afterburner noise to get grants, uh, $50 million for the city, to buy up and demolish 200 affordable homes on the 44 acres across from the airport. They demolished those homes. It's now vacant land, just waiting for a zoning change so the developers can come in and make millions and millions on new construction. We say, ground the F-35 now. The federal government brought the F-35 to Vermont. But under the Constitution, here's the facts. Training the guard is totally under the authority of the state of Vermont. That means the governor has the authority to ground the F-35. The governor is the commander-in-chief of the Guard, and he directs the training of the Guard. And if he doesn't want them to train with F-35 jets, he can say no more training. 
And that's the end of it. The federal government can't come in and overrule him. He can instead order the guard to fight the COVID pandemic, to fight global warming, and to fight racism. To save the planet and our futures, we are determined to build the campaign to ground the F-35, to build unity among students and working people of all races and genders, to abolish racism, materialism, poverty, and militarism. Thank you very much.
and I encourage you all to go to the town meetings, raise your voices, stay involved, and vote. It's not too late. Thank you.
Thanks everyone for being here. Um, there's only a few more speakers left and then I'm really excited to join everyone um, down at Battery Park for some teaching so we can turn all of this energy into action moving forward. Um, my name is Jack Hansen. I'm a city councilor in Burlington and I'm a climate activist. I work on sustainable transportation issues. Um, I'm gonna perform in a few minutes a poem for you all, but first I just wanted to say a couple words. If you're here today, it's because you know that something is wrong. Something is deeply, deeply wrong. And you know that it's on us to do something about that. The biggest thing I think we need to do is instill in ourselves, and especially in young people that we know, is that nobody's going to come in and fix the issue of, climate, of the climate crisis for us, or the issue of systemic racism or any of the major challenges we face. Nobody else is gonna come from above and fix those challenges. It's on us and we need to all step up and the future is ours. So we're either gonna do it or it's not gonna happen. So thank you all for being here and stepping up to take action. And I hope that that continues um, every day going forward. And really what this is about is, do we think that this is something worth fighting for? With the climate crisis, everything that we know and love is on the line. So that's what we're out there fighting for every single day. And I really appreciate what the last speaker said about bringing people in who don't necessarily see themselves as an activist. I think it's important for all of us to realize that no matter what type of person you are, no matter what your skill set is, you have a role in this movement and you have so much to contribute to move this movement forward. And that could look different for everyone. So please just find ways to get involved and use your unique skills and, and talents to move this forward. And I promise you have so much to gain as well from being a part of this. So thank you all for being part of this community. And I'm just going to do a poem briefly. I'll take idealist over ideal less. I'm a realist trying to change what real is. Feel this realness that leaves my lips. Desperate to send a message that's ever pressing. It's depressing that we see so few expressing anything when this is affecting everything. So I'm addressing what is vexing me. I guess I'm venting. But I'm an activist, staying active and passionate. The passion innate and I'm in it for the average. Against the avarice and the bad habits, it's an uplift battle that we're trying to grapple with. Climb it up like scaffolding. We don't have to live as we live. That's why I have to give all I have to give. No additives or preservatives, let's keep it natural. Back to the basics before there was capital. I'll never give up because I'm continuing this great struggle. Even if I can't make magic like a muggle, I'll do what I can. That's all I can do. And if you make an honest effort, I'm proud of you too. Because I'm nowhere near greatness. I probably never will be. But I'll keep trying to improve until the day it kills me. What wills me is the people who brought the passion to what they believed in. I'd like to be a fraction. As noble as these people, always reaching high towards the sky like a steeple. I'd only hope to be as dope as these folks who have given everything their passion and skills. So let's keep rising up like windmills. Thank you. involved because you matter 
and our future matters, and the children of our children, they want to live on this planet. They want to be able to economically survive and not have to um, fight for their basic needs and their basic human dignity. So when we think about the intersection, we have to really think about regular people, you, me, people around the planet, people who have the options to migrate, people who don't have the economic means to move out of areas of the planet that are being burned, that are being flooded, that are drying up. I have family in Cape Town who are literally rationing water less than 12 or 18 months ago. It is real. And while we live on a part of the planet that is pretty well resourced, there will be climate migration of people with economic needs. What does that mean for the people who are here in Vermont in terms of dignity in their work, in service industries where they're not being paid a livable wage already? What are we going to do to prepare to support folks who live here today and the folks who will be migrating here tomorrow? So often in the fight for justice, the opponents try to, to force artificial, artificial binary thinking about well, we can't have good paying jobs because, you know, that's, that's just not, you know, it's too expensive or the transition's too costly or it's too, you have to be, um, it's, too, it's too hard to do the work. And yet when we look at uh, poor people and where, they, uh, where they're living, they also get forced to um, be questioned about they're living in places um, and why can't they just move? Why can't they just migrate somewhere after a hurricane uh, decimates where they live? Well, we have to really, again, center the discussion around workers and regular people and make sure that they are centered in the change we're trying to make. Because when people who are impacted um, the most are at the table, change happens. We have to imagine a different possibility. So when we hear about things like the Green New Deal, the Red New Deal, there are paths towards the future. There are paths towards possibility on what we can do. But we need bold political courage because climate change is a bold problem. And we didn't, and you know, people who are being, or are running for office need to really stand up and come to play and really make sure that we're um, not slapping band-aids and short-term uh, policies on, on really big um, problems. All right, let me focus where I am on my notes here. See, mom problems, right? Pandemic parenting is real, by the way. Uh, all right, so what are the alternatives? Well, we can increase wages for work that's around energy efficiency. We can increase wages for jobs to build a sustainable, um, energy jobs for, for our future. We can increase wages for the low for low carbon work that is about building local communities, climate uh, for child care workers and educators and frontline essential workers. And we have to do all of this by centering our BIPOC brothers and sisters and our siblings. We have to look for women and non-gender gender binary people. We have to really make sure these are jobs for the future that are about people's well-being, their social well-being, their economic well-being. So, a couple of final thoughts. These jobs also should be unionized. Unions lift people from, uh, from the bottom up. They democratize our workplaces. They give people a voice in the workplace. And it's incredibly important that we really value that democracy in the workplace so it's sustainable, that jobs um, are paying livable wages and providing real benefits. And finally, you know, the, when we look at what's ahead of us um, in, the, in the future of Vermont, we have to remember that those who are most under-resourced are the folks who are, who are suffering the most and, and really just trying to survive to get by. So why they're not here today is because not because they're apathetic, but because they're literally in survival mode. So when we look at how we can rally people together and, and bring people into the movement, we have to make room uh, to really understand the barriers facing people and why they're not showing up. It's not that they don't matter, it's that they have a lot, um, a lot of survival uh, basic needs um, that, they're trying to, that they're trying to put together. So thank you very much. Let's keep up the fight. You matter. Vote. Make your friends to vote. Your family to vote. Thank you. Thank you everyone for sticking around and I won't talk too long. Um, first, uh, I thought I was far enough away, apparently not. Uh, I want to thank you all for being organizers and activists. I remember, unfortunately too long ago, as a UVM student organizing rallies at UVM, at the library on the green, walking through dorms, registering students to vote, organizing events 
bringing folks down to here as well. And so thank you for continuing because it is a continuous struggle that you are fighting, that I was with you fighting before, I'm with you now. You might not even know who I am. I'm David Zuckerman. I'm your Lieutenant Governor, by the way, and I'm running for Governor. But I'm trying to bring, I'm trying to bring an organizing and activist mindset to governance. It's not easy to do. And it's with your help and other people organizing all over the state around climate justice issues, around the issues of privilege and who has it and who don't. And it's about not only making sure voices can speak for themselves, but also at times when they can't, helping to amplify their voices. Because not everybody, as Emma just said, can always be at the rallies, can always come out and do this, because they're struggling to put food on their table. They're struggling to keep a roof over their head. They're struggling day in and day out. Maybe it's with various health issues. And so those of us that have the privilege to be able to speak out also have to do so. And we have to work to bring those other voices in whenever available. I want to let you know that I'm also an organic farmer. And when it comes to the planet and the earth, when you think about our food and our water, we have to think about these issues. And the reason I'm an organic farmer is because as a student at UVM, learning in environmental studies about the impact of agriculture on our planet, on our water, on our air, and on our neighbors. And when we think about climate issues and climate justice, you have to, we all recognize that the millions and millions of refugees around the world are often because of the climate crisis. Rising seawaters pushing people away from the coasts desertification expanding. These issues are real, and they're affecting people every single day. And you know that. And I thank you for knowing that. And I thank you for amplifying that, because there's a lot of people that don't know. And being an activist is not only making demands, but it's also educating and listening and bringing more people in. So thank you for doing that. I just want to briefly say two more thoughts. One. I want to recognize that Molly Gray is here. She's running for Lieutenant Governor, right over there. And I hope, for those of you that vote, that you'll vote for both of us. And for those of you that don't vote, I want you to seriously think about the ramifications of what will happen if we are not elected or other good people are not elected. I get it that you don't always have all the choices you want. We need to keep amplifying the opportunity for more choices that you want. So use your vote wisely and choose, but I do hope you'll support both of us. And my other thought was about when I am in the governor's office. I'm going to tell a brief story. When I got elected lieutenant governor four years ago, it was almost exactly four years ago, and that night should have been one of the most joyous nights of my life. I was going to be in a position to make incredible change, so I thought. I was elected statewide for the first time, which is a really hard thing to do. But this abomination of democracy was also elected. This person who has destroyed any sense of dignity for all of us who are trying to serve in public office. And I remember that night going to bed around 1 o'clock in a hotel room just down on the waterfront here with my wife and my daughter. She was 10 years old. And I was thinking about two issues, the Supreme Court and the climate crisis. And in the last four years, I have felt hopeless. As Lieutenant Governor, I have felt hopeless. So I can only imagine what all of you have been feeling with this person as president. And we have lost four years, four critical, critical years to make progress. But we didn't only lose that opportunity nationally. In the last four years, carbon dioxide has gone up emissions in Vermont. The opportunities to talk about climate crisis in Vermont have been vetoed by the current governor. It is not only about the national election. And as someone else said earlier, we have work to do after this election, no matter who 
wins. Whether Biden wins, whether I win, whether Molly wins, we all have to be working together to keep moving forward in a much bolder way to tackle the climate crisis, the racial injustice, and the economic injustice that exists in our society. So thank you for rallying. Keep rallying, keep educating, keep learning, keep listening, and keep amplifying. Thank you. Wow. Can I get another applause for David Zuckerman real quick? Can you raise your hands if you're going to go vote for David Zuckerman or you've already voted for David Zuckerman? That's too bad. Um, and just one last, maybe David can close his ears, but can we get like a Fuckville Scott real quick? All right. Fuckville Scott! Thank you. Um, so we are done with our speakers right now. We have one last thing um, for us to do before we go down to Battery Park. Um, I think that you all might notice this jet that we have down here. Um, it's actually not because we like the F-35s. Quite the opposite, in fact. Um, we hate them. Um, and they, as all the speakers have told us, um, have been destroying communities and harming individuals within those communities. And so I think that it's our turn to destroy a little bit of F-35. As a treat. Y'all want to come hit this thing? Come on, let's go. <laughs> Can you all start like clapping? I want like a nice atmosphere for this. the F-35s and want a little slump. This is actually the biggest pinata that will ever open because we knock this shit down and we pull out healthcare for our communities. We pull out a Green New Deal. We pull out public housing for our communities. And we get this little thing out of the sky. Um, I think that we need Midday to go in one more time with both sticks and just give it like a really nice whack. Come on, Midday, you got this. Hey. All right. So thank you, everybody. Can we get a one last round of applause for all the speakers that came out today? 
So now we're going to go transition to the Teach In section at Battery Park, um, featuring Beverly Little Thunder of the Standing Rock Lakota Band, um, talking about the intersection of indigenous sovereignty and climate justice, um, which I think is a very, very important topic for us to all hear about. Um, I know that you're all tired. I'm tired, too. Um, we have People's Kitchen Mutual Aid Food at Battery Park for you all to partake in, re-energize yourselves, discuss as a community. So thank you all so much for coming out today. We'll get organized. Um, if people want to help me maybe clean up the mess that we just made, um, that would be fun as well. But yeah, one last round of applause. Thank you so much. <laughs>